Hello, I'm Barry Forshaw. I'm the author of a variety of books on crime fiction. I also edited the, the following. This is the uh, Encyclopedia of British Crime Writing, Volumes 1 and 2, which is, um, well, the prices online vary from £100 to more affordable prices. I wrote a goodly chunk of it, but I also had some excellent people helping me out. I had people like Val McDermott, Andrew Taylor, David Stewart Davis, Laura Wilson, Natasha Cooper, and a lot of other people, Ayana Tade, Ali Karim, were all helping me out. So it is a joint effort. But as I've said in doing earlier chapters in this book, this is my one-stop volume. This is all me, and it's um, basically the entire history of crime fiction from Edgar Allan Poe and even further back up to the present. We are now up to chapter three. And as you can see behind me, I've got my DVDs. I was told by people from earlier uh, broadcasts I'd done that I should move around and show them different um, shelves in the house. So that's precisely what I'm doing. So chapter three, which is hard boiled and pulp. And remember, this is only a five minute uh, precy. So people are going to say, where's David Goodis? Where's Jim Thompson? They're in the book. And I just mentioned them there. But I am going to talk in these five minutes about the two titans. Both of them appeared in Black Mask magazine. Black Mask magazine is the most influential of the American pulps. And of course, it was the place where we first saw Raymond Chandler, or those old enough to remember, which isn't me, and Dashiell Hammett. And these remain the, the twin titans of the, the pulp era. There are a lot of other very good writers who came out of that era. But basically, I spent a lot of time on, on those two uh, writers. Raymond Chandler. Well, when people are asked, as I am, what's your favorite crime novel? It's kind of a lazy answer to say The Big Sleep, but it is The Big Sleep. And The Big Sleep, I'm reaching for my copy of it now, I'm putting on my glasses. And I don't really need to tell you why Raymond Chandler is so good other than just to read you the opening paragraph. It was about 11 o'clock in the morning, mid-October, with the sun not shining and a look of hard, wet rain and the cleanness of the foothills. I was wearing my powder blue suit with dark blue shirt and display handkerchief, black brogues, black wool socks and dark blue clocks on them. I was neat, clean, shaved and everything the well-dressed private detective ought to be. I was calling on four million dollars. Now what about that? Who could not carry on with, a, with a, an opening paragraph like that? It's as good as uh, the opening paragraph of Fleming's um, Casino Royale, which I recommend you go over to a show and read right now. Uh, Chandler is most people's favorite. When I've interviewed uh, crime writers in Italy, in Germany, in Sweden, you name it, uh, his name comes up uh, along with Conan Doyle of, uh, of the, first, the first crime writer that a lot of people read. It is that use of language. That, loose, that use of language dazzles. But there's a slight um, misconception about Chandler, which he fed into himself. The fact that he wasn't very good at plotting. He seemed happy to, um, to, to accept this, uh, which actually is a canard. It isn't true. The famous stories about how Hawks ringing him up when he was filming The Big Sleep, asking who killed who, and Chandler giving us the answer. In fact, the plotting is very good. It's all over the place. It's incredibly complex. It has the feel that Chandler is making it up as he goes along, and often utilizing uh, short stories he wrote with an earlier version of Philip Marlowe called John Dalmas. All of that is true, but the plotting is still good. There are problematical elements for modern readers. Uh, you have to say, in Chandler, it's always a case of cherche la femme. The women don't come out of it too well. There are a couple of admirable women, but mostly they are the, the source of evil and death in the books, one has to say. Uh, and there's also things like uh, a reference to black bars being ginger bars. But one has to remember when he was when he was writing this. Uh, he's still most people's favorite and, and understandably so. As Crime Fiction a Reader's Guide is also about films, I'm gonna bring on board here the films of um, Raymond Chandler. I'd ask anybody watching this now who they think, if they don't already know the answer, is Raymond Chandler's favorite film, Philip Marlowe. They, the obvious answer would be Humphrey Bogart. It isn't. Although The Big Sleep is probably the best film, of um, the Howard Hawks film is the best film of, of Chandler. 
he himself preferred Dick Powell because he had the idea of a slightly lighter, slightly more intellectual figure than Bogart could present. And he said famously, Dick Powell, in Farewell My Lovely or Murder My Sweet, it's uh, the other title, um, that he could imagine him playing chess. If you haven't heard the BBC tapes that Chandler makes with his friend Ian Fleming, because they both grew tired of their hero and wanted to kill him off, but knew that they couldn't. It's very interesting because uh, Chandler, who of course was educated at Dulwich, when he goes back to the States, Americans say he's British. He sounds British to them. Now, if you find those tapes of Chandler and Fleming speaking together, it's perfectly obvious to our ears who the drawling upper crust Englishman is and who the American is, but apparently he was left with a little English polish. And I have to now quickly move on to Dashiell Hammett. Hammett in many ways is, is a more literary figure, certainly a more political figure coming from the left and his, his long relationship with uh, Lillian Hellman. Um, he wrote the book, which for many people is the definitive book of the hard boiled era, which is Red Harvest. Now, you may not have read Red Harvest, but you've seen it. There is a film of Red Harvest. And if you've seen Clint Eastwood's A Fistful of Dollars, if you've seen Akira Kurosawa's Yojimbo, if you've seen uh, Last Man Standing and dozens of other ripoffs of this idea of a, a town called P Personville, which, which is called Poisonville by the people who lives in it, live in it, and this lone maverick figure who plays two evil groups off against other each other for, for their advantage. He's also the creator of The Thin Man, which is the prototype of the witty, sardonic duo. Again, multiply ripped off. Hammett needs to be read. He also has this use of language, which is very different from Chandler. Chan Chandler's use of language is Baroque and florid. Hammett's is, is pared down and lean and sinewy, very much in the vein of, uh, of Ernest Hemingway. I'm gonna quickly mention a couple of other uh, hard-boiled writers. I've mentioned David Goodis, I've mentioned Jim Thompson. There is, of course, James M. Cain. And all three of these writers that I've just discussed are all multiply ripped off. But James M. Cain himself was not above a bit of ripping off. Because if you've read Emile Zola's Therese Racan, you'll see exactly where the plot of The Postman Always Rings Twice comes from, and even elements of double indemnity. You've got the young couple who can't keep their hands off each other, uh, who fall to the floor in this br short, brutal, sexual escapade. And there's an inconvenient older husband who has to be got out of the way. Well, Zilla did that first. But James M. Cain in uh, these beautifully short and lean books, he's not in the same class as Hammond and Chandler, but he's still a remarkable writer. We have to include Mickey Spillane. Now, Mickey Spillane was cordially loathed by Raymond Chandler because... He felt that he took the, the, the idea of the, the knight errant, uh, the, the private eye who is kind of a moral figure, and basically turned him into Mike Hammer, who is basically a fascist thug. He's right. I think one has to say he's right. But there is no question that Spillane's books do move like an express train if you can take their um, slightly unpleasant undertones. Um, it's interesting that the film of Mickey Spillane's Kiss Me Deadly the Robert Eldridge film. I once met him at the National Film Theatre and he couldn't understand why everybody thought Robert Eldridge's film of him was so good. Actually, it's much better than his novel. The novel is just about drugs. Robert Eldridge's film is about a great atomic mystery. The ending of Robert Eldridge's film is the opening of Pandora's box. I wouldn't say anything more than that for anybody who's not seen the film. And it's a richer film. It's the, probably the reason Mickey Spillane disliked it is because uh, Robert Eldridge treated Mike Hammer as a thug, basically a brutal thug. Um, I nevertheless suggest that you should pick up the odd Mickey Spillane novel, either Jory, um, Kiss Me Deadly, and see why so many thousands and thousands of Americans, particularly GIs, read those books. But in the end, one goes back to the big sleep. That's chapter three, and I'll be back with chapter four.